Now, normally I would set the table with this dialogue, but I've asked Daryl if he would set the table, take five or 10 minutes and lay out for us the problem, and then uh, yeah, right. I'll get to play lawyer uh, uh, as I quiz these folks and give them a chance to give their perspective on things. So I'm turning off my mic. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear, Daryl, would you set our table for us? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, and normally this would come after what I'm gonna do tomorrow night. So I just wanna put this in context. One of the points I'm gonna make tomorrow night is going to be that the church needs to be a better listener in order to better engage with the culture around it. And so I'm gonna start with a Bible verse. Uh, this is the Bible verse that's at the base of what I'm gonna say this afternoon. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. That's James 1, 19 and 20. I always like to set it next to what I call the modern version of this verse. Let every person be slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to anger, for the anger of man allows me to vent about all that is wrong with the world. <laughs> so um, that's the contrast of where we are. And, and so I've spent a lot of time studying how difficult conversations work. At the key of difficult conversations, I'm gonna give you a term like you get on Sesame Street. Uh, the term for the day is triphonics. You know, you have stereo and quadraphonic sound. I have to uh, explain this illustration to young people. And uh, you know, four speakers coming at you simultaneously with slightly different sound, the mixture of which gives you the fullness of what's going on. Any conversation has three core parts to it, and all three things are happening simultaneously between you and the person in different ways in a difficult conversation. And of course, the more partners you have in the conversation, the more complicated it gets. So here are the three levels. First is the topic that you're talking about. Uh, and oftentimes, people get stuck because they think they're talking about the topic when actually all the dynamics are going elsewhere. So that's the first point to make. The second level is what I call the lenses and the emotions attached to those lenses that allows us to see what's in front of us and how we process what it is that we're hearing or seeing. To illustrate that category, all I have to do is say Fox and CNN. They are looking at the same phenomena, but when you're done listening to them, you wonder if they live on the same planet. So just just think about that. that. The lenses cause us to be drawn to certain things and also repel certain things that we are hearing and what, we're be what is being raised for us. So that's important. But it's not even near as important as the third level, which is how my identity is wrapped up in this conversation. How I see myself in relationship to the topic that we are discussing and why it's important to me. In all difficult conversations, okay, I said all difficult conversations, people think they're only talking about the topic when they actually are interacting with the other two things that often are not seen. So that's what triphonics is. It's, three, it's a three-way conversation that's happening internally as you are engaging with someone else, and your internals don't match the internals of the person you're engaging with. So that's important to understand, just about the dynamics of conversation. So this raises the question, if you're gonna have a conversation, it's really gonna be a conversation, then um, what kind of listener are you? And I have a test that I like to give people that tells them pretty quickly what kind of a listener they are. In fact, whether they're a listener at all. Because if you are a person in what I call the rebutter, the rebutter is processing their response with their agenda as the person is speaking to them. That probably gets in the way of good listening. The listener is thinking through, am I really understanding what this person is saying to me and why they're saying it to me, and why they're saying it to me. The whys and the wherefores of where someone else is coming from. So I say in a difficult conversation, your first responsibility is to get a spiritual GPS reading on where that person is coming from. Your doctrinal meter is on mute, okay? And you're simply listening to the whys and wherefores that drive someone. You're asking questions. 
It allows them to explain the whys and wherefores of where they are coming from. And your initial response is not an assessment, but simply to understand where the, your conversation partner stands and why. And let them say it in their own words. You're building a relational base for the engagement that you're going to have. And that relational base hopefully ends up being two-way. And the fact that you set a certain tone in that conversation opens up the opportunity for you when it's your turn to speak by the way you engage. And so you're asking a lot of questions. You're letting them tell their story. You're understanding. You understand that trying to understand someone is not the same thing as assessing them. And everything belongs in its proper order in trying to understand exactly what's going on. That's the second point I want to make. What kind of listener are you? Then there are five things we do that damage conversations. Now, because I'm only setting the table, I'm only going to give you two. One is what's called the pivot. The pivot is something PR relations people teach church leaders how to do in public square space. I know because I've been instructed on the pivot. The pivot is something uncomfortable, a topic you don't want to address comes your way, and you're told either to acknowledge it quickly and turn, pivot as quickly as you can somewhere else, or sometimes just ignore the question that's been asked and get to the topic that you want to talk about as quick as you can. A, another formation of the pivot is what's called whataboutism. Someone raises something that leaves you short and you, you uh, respond, in effect in rebuttal, with um, something that is what about they need to deal with. The relational effect of doing that is, is that you've disrespected the person who's raised the initial issue with you because you've basically dismissed what it is they're raising for you. That's called the pivot. The second one is what I'll simply call demonization. I like to have fun with this one. It's also known what I call the exorcist, okay? Um, this is one in which um, we all do this. We're all guilty of it. We see it in 30-second bites in almost every political commercial that airs on television. It is a bad example that has been deeply ingrained in the soul of our society. It works like this. I label you so I can do this. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. I would go on, but I don't have time. You play taps over what it is that they're saying by labeling them. It becomes a way not to have a substantive discussion about what's underneath it, and it's dismissive, and we all do it. It's an equal opportunity employer. Let me show you how equal opportunity employer it is by doing some of this. Here comes the exorcism. L, liberal. C, conservative. M, Marxist, F, fundamentalist, S, socialist, W, woke. It ends up being a way of killing conversation because his intent is actually to not have the conversation. Those are two things that we do out of five that damage our conversations. Let me mention a couple of things that can advance a conversation. There are two here. First, it is, and I've already said this in many ways, it is to be curious with open ears. It is to care enough about your conversation partner, even though they may be coming from a different place, that you give them the respect of trying to understand exactly where they're coming from and why. And then the second thing that advances a conversation that helps when you're in this mode is what you are looking for are shared values that may be applied in different ways. You're looking for shared values that might be applied. And so a person has, says, I, I, I'm interested in, in, in the well-being of, of a person. And they may apply it in one way, and you may apply it in another. But you can at least say, you know what, I share that value. I just apply it differently. So let's talk about that. And what you see is it takes the confrontation out of the conversation. And you're looking, at least groping for, if I can say it that in, in some cases, for common ground and seeing if there's any common ground that you can have a basis for having a better conversation on. So those are two things we can do to advance a conversation. And then the last thing I want to put on the table, and then we'll open it up, is there are three types of issues in the public square. This is a generic template that I'm talking about. There are three types.
The first is what I call genuine worldview clashes. These are views that are so inherently diametrically opposed to one another, there's very little common ground and they're the hardest kinds of conversations to have because you're starting from such absolutely different places. In reality, I think most conversations don't belong in this category, but the reason why we fight so much is that many people put most conversations in this category. So that's, that's an important initial observation. The second kind of difficult type of conversation is what I call same goal, different route. Um, the, put up, the example I have for this category is racial reconciliation. If I walk out on the street and ask the basic question, should the races be reconciled to one another, I will get numbers in terms of positive response to that question that would be so high, political people running for office said, man, I'd like those numbers. If I ask the next question, how do we do it? Now we have the conversation. But at least we have the same goal in mind. So it's a different kind of conversation than a strict worldview clash. The third type of conversation is the one where most of our public discourse resides and we've set it up in such a way that it becomes difficult to get anywhere. The third category is what I call clashing values in a dysfunctional fallen world. In this category, each side is defending a virtue or a value of some sort, and it is colliding with a value coming from the other side. And they're in conflict with one another because we live in a dysfunctional fallen world. And what happens in our public discourse is each side takes the value that they value and raises it up, and they take the value that kind of puts pressure on the value that they have, and they try either to neuter it or minimize it. Of course, when that happens, each side is forcing you to take a side. And you never have the conversation that you need, which is, how do I calibrate legitimate concerns coming from each end that need to be calibrated and adjudicated? What, how do I prioritize? How do we put these together side by side so they work harmoniously rather than clashing? And because we never have that discussion, we never get anywhere because you're forced to choose before you even get to that discussion. I would submit to you that most of our public discourse in public issues related to politics belong in the third category, not in the first. And the moment you do that, you give yourself room to engage with a listening approach to the person who's coming from a different space than you are perhaps with a different set of priorities, but you may actually, underneath, when you explore it, have very similar values that you simply have applied differently or have prioritized differently. And that helps us in public discourse. So that's my set table. I'm not sure if I took too long, Mark, but there we go. No, that was perfect. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. A great setting of the table. I've, we've got a lot to discuss, and so uh, we will commence with this, and that is each of you come from uh, a different angle of, um, of experience in, in life and academia. And so it, the way the table's been set before we get into the details, uh, do you have something that you wish to add or take away or focus upon based upon your areas of expertise? Uh, uh, hearing Daryl set the table like this, again, we're going to get into the practicals of how we do this, but first, just in terms of the table being set, how do you approach it perhaps differently or what would you underscore because of your own experience? I think one thing I would uh, want to make sure that we emphasize is Daryl's talking about the triphonic approach because I think, especially for Christians, they think a lot of times that I'm only talking from a quote unquote biblical perspective. And so the everything else that they're actually talking about is veiled. And the other commitments that are often perhaps even competing with their biblical convictions, those things are often unacknowledged. Uh, and when that happens, then I think people are, un people are 
not aware, perhaps, that's the generous way of putting it anyway, that they're, they're not aware that they might be saying, look, all I care about is loyalty to God and his word, when really there are other loyalties at work and other commitments that are, sometimes people call them control beliefs, that those are the other things that are functioning for them and really are setting the table more than their biblical beliefs. Their biblical beliefs a lot of times are sponsoring the other commitments rather than critiquing those commitments. Okay. Yeah, Danny? Yeah, Daryl and I are dear friends for decades. I won't say how many because they are many. <laughs> you, grew, you, you grew up together. We grew up together. He, in fairness, you all need to know, Daryl taught Danny how to play basketball. <laughs> We're not going to even go there. Um, but I... I you don't have to answer the question, it, but it's just, uh, in Spanish, it's inquietud. I mean, there's kind of an uneasiness. Uh, and in speaking for the Latino background, um, one thing is a topic, but another thing is if you are, you are the topic. And so I, I'm thinking of immigrants. Uh, I go to a Latino church and been writing on this for many, many years. And so... Um, all of a sudden, you're the topic of conversation, oftentimes from a position of no power, uh, maybe not even be able to handle even the language. And so those kind of conversations are, are more complicated because when an immigrant comes into this country, it's the constant negotiation of loss. Loss of language, loss of food, loss of how you dress, loss of how you greet one another, loss of how you celebrate Christmas and your birthdays and all these things. And so now you're in a conversation that you're, you're the topic of the conversation and it's another negotiation uh, that may be another negotiation of loss. And so you watch this between first and second generation Latinos. Um, and then what you find, and we see it at the college level is that a Latino or Latina, now the, the goal is to speak up and you know, um, to react against all of this. And so I'm just saying there's certain populations that this gets raised and it, it's also negotiations of power, who has the right to speak, the outlets to speak, uh, the language to speak, uh, all these things. So that might be a part of our discussion, but I thought I'd just put that on the table. I would assume with my African-American brothers, this would be working out in a different kind of historical context from the Latino context, but that would be part of the conversation, I would think, when you are the topic of conversation, <laughs> not just a social topic. You, you are the topic. And the result, that's actually one of the reasons why listening is so important. Yeah. Listening becomes important because when, you, when, the, when the space is occupied, the three-pronged space of triphonics is occupied at two levels simultaneously in different ways. Your identity is the topic, mm -hmm. but your identity is also at stake in what's going on and how even the whole com conversation is framed, yeah. okay? Yeah. Then that's actually one of the rationales why listening becomes so important. And when you are the topic of legislation. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Which is something African Americans have worked with for 150 years, mm -hmm. but is now relevant to Latinos. Yeah, longer. All right, Daniel? Yeah, one, this isn't a, a disagreement or anything. I think, uh, what Daryl, one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that there are some, or what I'm hearing when you're saying that, there's some understated, val under girding values. Mm -hmm. And I think one of them that what you're saying reminded me of is that we are, we are bound together in a common life. There's no escaping that we share a common life with the people we disagree with, um, with our quote unquote political rivals. Um, there, is no, there is no policy in a democratic republic where they are removed and no longer participants in that common life. And as Christians, we shouldn't want that for them. And so we, the question is how can we go and get along? Like how can we get a, keep moving forward together? Um, and that's one of the values I hear kind of undergirding some of that. Let me, let me frame it this way, because I think this will make your point really sharp. I tell people that when 
you ask someone if they are uh, an American citizen, and they, of course, say yes, that the observation needs to be made that your religious commitment means nothing in terms of being an American citizen. Let me explain what I mean by that. Whether I am an agnostic, an atheist, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, whatever, I have the same rights before the government. I'm in the same space in terms of what it means to be a citizen. Now the application of that, because of the way the law applies, that could be another conversation. But the point I'm making is theoretically, in terms of the way our law is supposed to be structured, our religious commitment means nothing in our public space as citizens. And yet all of us, in one way or another, bring who we are, including our spiritual elements, to that conversation. So that opens up this question. How do I come to the table? Do I come to the table with a sense of privilege out of my religious identity into that kind of public space? Or do I come to that public space, because we're talking about getting along, come to that public space simply recognizing that I'm one of many people at the table, each of whom has the right to be a citizen, and each, each of whom has their set of concerns that we have to negotiate with one another in order to get along. Uh, I think that's the challenge the church faces because what I think the church has sometimes done is it has come to the table with a sense of privilege about being at that table because of the way they see themselves in relationship to the history and background of the, of the country. All right, so I'm listening to this, and I'm listening as a church person, but I'm also listening as a lawyer. And um, I'm also listening as someone who teaches communication theory and communication. And so one of the questions that I would put to you, Daryl, principally, but to all of you, is what you are saying right now. Does it make a difference on who the participants are in the dialogue, like Danny said, sometimes you're one of the subjects of inquiry. Does it make a difference who they are and what the purpose of the conversation is? In other words, is this a dinner party where you're just trying to get to know someone and make a friend? Or do you have a purpose beyond that of winning a political argument or converting a soul to the Lord? I mean, do, do what... Or, or establishing a doctrine or a dogma that will be followed by your community, or winning a political election, does the purpose of the dialogue weigh in on how that discussion would typically be held or should be held? I think the answer is obvious. Yeah, of course it does. Um, and. Uh, but there's, what I'm pushing for here is a relational base, no matter what form the conversation takes or what the goal is, that is operating even as I engage, perhaps, in what is often going to be a controversial or contentious environment. And so there's not only what I say, there's how I say it. There's not only, let me say it this way, it's not only what I defend, it's how I defend it. And so there is a different, even though these conversations will have different dynamics because of where they take place and what their goal is, et cetera, all that's there, there is a core commitment that I, need, I think a Christian needs to have about how they have these conversations. Okay. Oh, Danny? Yeah, I was just going to say a couple of things. Um, again, these are just topics for further discussion, but what if you're not a citizen? So you're saying, well, before the government, we have all the same rights because we're all citizens. The answer is no, we're not. Mm -hmm. There's millions of immigrants who are not citizens, and they're the topic. Uh, so that's, that might be an interesting, <laughs> uh, that changes the dynamic. That does change the yeah, dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just, uh, just to mention that. But um, one of the things that I hear uh, a lot from, you know, I'll speak for the Latino, is... No one hears our voice. We're the invisible people. And you know, you go into a restaurant and the busboys and the people in the kitchen, even if it's an Italian restaurant, they're all Latinos. They're, they're invisible, no one sees them. Um, 
So they're the invisible people uh, that are the target of the conversation. And even the citizenship thing, and again, I don't want to impinge on, this is all secondary, of course, but for my African-American brothers and sisters, that was precisely the problem. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, what would it mean for an African-American to be a citizen, even to have the right to vote, uh, and the lingering racism in this country? And now there's multiple racisms. It's not only against African-Americans, it's against Latinos and Asians and Asian-Americans and all these things. So um, I totally endorse what, what you're saying. I'm just trying to complicate the conversation. All and right, so, oh, go mm -hmm. please, Spencer. I think so. Yes is my answer to your question, but here's the thing, it, and this is what I think is really important about what Daryl's saying, it's getting people to be willing to recognize that themselves, mm -hmm. rather than front-loading the conversation with whatever commitments they have in the moment about whatever is ultimate for them in the moment, rather than first p pausing and asking the question, what kind of conversation is this? Where is this? What are my aims for this? Mm -hmm. Who's here? How's, how aware am I of all the people who's here? How am I aware of I of the different commitments, the different histories? How much do I actually know <laughs> about anything that the people even think or believe in this conversation? All those types of things I think are really important, and a lot of times the, the temptation is, no, I've got to be right, as if, as if there's this panic mode that people are in that then intensifies how they actually are less willing to be aware of all those different potential circumstances mm -hmm. that we've described. Okay, so um, if we look at it with goal in mind, and one common area that I think we have is oftentimes we're trying to persuade someone to agree with us. We're trying to get them on our side of an issue, for example. Um, how we go about it, you spoke uh, uh, as you set the table, Daryl, and you talked about things that damage and things that advance conversation. Um, and then when you said there are three types of issues, you, you, you give us an arena where we can flesh that out sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got sitting behind me uh, Dr. Randy Lowry. Uh, Randy, uh, aside from being a dear friend for the last 40 years, nah, I think 40 years, has been a leader in legal circles at uh, um, these discussions in legal mediation, trying to get parties that are as antagonistic as possible to come to an agreement on issues that frequently involve heavy economics or heavy personal relationships, which parents gonna get kids in a divorce, um, real issues that people really struggle on. And one of the illustrations that, that he has taught um, involves when you're in a dialogue with someone, the effect of what he calls playing X's and O's. And I want to have him take a minute to explain it because I want y'all to react to this and he can set the table better than I can on the question. Thank you, Mark. I love coming to your uh, afternoon conversations and being part of it, more literally than I thought I would be. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> Uh, this is really good stuff, and uh, I'll just share one little piece of, of the world that we work in. Uh, as a professional mediator, no one ever calls when things are going well. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. Mm -hmm. So you're always walking into a conflict that's already erupted. The people can't figure it out, whether it's lawyers or it's the parties. And somehow you have to bring in, in that context, something that could be helpful. This is, I think... Uh, an extraordinarily simple, but reflective of what you folks are saying, approach. And that is simply to recognize that people talk from positions. Mm -hmm. So think about that. CNN, mm -hmm. Fox, politics. We talk from positions. This is my position. And we believe that we would be most influential as we escalate our position. And of course, the other side believes the same thing, and so we both escalate these positions, and shortly after that, the marriage falls apart, the church splits, or, or whatever it might be. The alternative is to say, while we have to deal with positions, uh, perhaps there's something else that could be talked about. 
And we would suggest in our language, and different disciplines mm -hmm. academically have different language, but in mine we would say, go below the line and try to talk in terms of interests. Interests are those things that motivate us. They're those things that drive us. Uh, they're very, very real to us. And often the conversation is extraordinarily difficult because the two parents arguing over this and that still want the very, very best for their kids. These people in a neighborhood that can't figure out some public policy still want to live in a tremendously good neighborhood. And over and over again, if we're able to draw people back to that conversation, they can be very creative in walking forward with some kind of resolution. Now, television doesn't like this, because <laughs> you can't make a good TV show out of a successful mediation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You make a good TV show because we have positions, we escalate them, there's a fight, uh, and yet that doesn't solve the world that we live in. So that's just a different language reflecting and I think complementing exactly what you're saying. So looking at it from that discipline, it sounds to me consistent with what y'all are saying. Mm -hmm. It's just a different discipline. But I'd love your comments and your feedback from that aspect of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying this when you, Mark, were asking the question. I wonder, so I became a Christian because someone handed me the book or the Bible and opened it up to Ecclesiastes and said, read through Ecclesiastes. So that tailors and colors my Christian life. Well, I think we can all say, yeah, we've been there. Yeah. In, uh, in more ways than I am probably aware. But I don't, I think that on the one hand, I want to live up to like the legacy of someone like a Frederick Douglass who's writing letters to Abraham Lincoln when Abraham Lincoln is insulting him on the basis of his race and still thinks this conversation is worth buying into. I want to live up to that legacy on the one hand. But on the other hand, I also recognize, I'm going to have three hands, that I'm a human person mm -hmm. who isn't all that I hope and aspire to be. And yet on the third hand, I don't know that I'm, my goal in a conversation is to win. I don't think that it has to be to win. I think it should be to, like, to bear witness to the love of God in Christ and that the Savior who loved me, imperfect as I am, uh, I can extend, extend that love. I mean, sometimes... I think the goal of, the, of a conversation can be for the person to be heard. I think there, I guess what I'm trying to say is there can be different goals, different arcs in a conversation that will then tailor and should affect how you respond uh, or don't to the, the things that are being said. But I, I don't think that the goal should be for them to agree with me at the end. I think, you know, I, I agree with that. I think getting people to actually get beneath the surface is very hard. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that's very hard, I think, at the moment that we're in is that there are people whose brand it is to froth people up all the time. <laughs> the irony about it, to me, for a lot of Christians is people who, uh, the way I always like to say it is, you, I think you said you were at church on Easter and, you, and all this business about resurrection and God winning in the end, but you, you act like whatever circumstance is getting you frothed up has, is the final word. And so there's something beneath the surface that people are really concerned about, but it's also becoming really threatened for them, or they perceive that as threatening for them, but then are articulating that, right? It, it, some other thing becomes the sort of, what is, is masking over that. And so if, if we could get people to really ask that question, that'd be really interesting, along with it, getting, trying to get them to the place of saying, hey, can you tell me what you really believe? Not what you say you believe what you really believe, because what you're showing me says you believe something else. Yeah, I, I think the um, term interest is another way to talk about the identity level. Um, what really drives me? Remember when I talked about um, getting a spiritual GPS reading? I said it's the whys and the wherefores of what drives a person. Okay, that is an interest space. That's exactly what that's about. And so, and when we bring in the issue of power, which is a, certainly another part of this conversation, 
and the perceptions about power and the realities of power, which, which sometimes are also not aligned, but are colliding. Um, those are all over the interest space. Um, when I, and, and again, I'm gonna come back to the value of listening. When I raise an issue and I frame it in terms of citizenship, and Danny rightly reminds us, there are people here who are impacted by our laws who are not citizens. In fact, not only are they impacted by our laws, we get to make the laws that impact them where they are ghosts. They are silent, they are invisible. And we ask ourselves, what moral responsibility do we have as we think about the construction of those kinds of laws for people in that situation? Those kinds of questions. All that I'm trying to say is, we need to be good listeners. We need to be hearing voices and perspectives that we generally are not trained to listen to and to hear and to pay attention to. Now, there may be a real conversation to have as a result of listening, but I'm in a much better place if I'm actually making the effort to listen than not. I happen to be currently reading the biography of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and the thing that strikes me as he tells his story of growing up as a kid, as a slave, and what, what he experienced, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even know when he was born. He's that much without location. Um, the only experience that he has of, his, of, of interacting with white people is in a violent context where they are disciplining slaves. Uh, that kind of thing. And I'm sitting here going, it helps me to understand someone's reaction when that is their life experience. And so there's just tremendous value, I think, in listening. And I actually think listening is an extension of love. That in the end, good listening is an extension of loving someone, caring enough about them to care about where they come from. Now, I may have perspectives. I've gone from understanding and then there's assessment. I may have perspectives that I want to bring to that conversation, but I better also be open in having those perspectives that the conversation that I have and that the listening that I'm engaging in can impact that level of my thinking. And I think what often happens is we come into a discussion where we have an agenda. We know what we want to do, and we may be very gracious and winsome about, about making the effort to understand, but I still have my agenda. Yeah, I, I think uh, agendas are definitely something that's real um, I, I, I the, there's no doubt a couple of points from what's been said first, first of all uh, a recent friend of mine now Fred Gray uh, Fred is um, a black attorney from Tuskegee Alabama who had the wonderful opportunity of representing Rosa Parks uh, in the bus mess hmm of representing Martin Luther King, uh, including the march to Selma, uh, who handled the cases for the Tuskegee Airmen that were uh, not treated for syphilis uh, as part of a grand experiment. Um, and I met with Fred and uh, several of his lawyers at his firm. Fred's now in his early 90s. Mm. A uh, wonderful fellow, right now scheduled to be at Champion Forest Baptist Church on Martin Luther King weekend mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be interviewed by our pastor from the pulpit. But, but um, Fred is, uh, I had the joy of going to his law office. And I was visiting, we, we, I wanted to see the files. I wanted to see something from Rosa Parks' mm -hmm. case or you know Martin Luther King's. But in the process, I asked him, who is your first white friend? Stumped him. Stumped him. Now, he's still alive today, but he had to sit there and think through it. And, and to understand and to realize. I said, what's the latest case you've been working on? And he said, well, I was working on a case this morning. It's on appeal to the Alabama Supreme Court. I said, what was the case? Or what is the case? It's a live case. He said, well, the park, the town square right across the street was deeded to the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1909 as a white-only park. 
with a Confederate soldier statue in the middle. And we've sued to make it a park for everybody. And I said to him, who on earth is on the other side of that case? How could anybody argue that? And he said, well, there are two daughters of the Confederacy who bought property in this county so that they could claim the county for their residence so that they could fight against this. Hmm. And it's being funded by them. And you sit there and you just wonder, you know, th there's real stuff out there. There are real issues that, that still exist that have to be dealt with. And so many of them, I think we're subconscious about. I have a friend, uh, we were in England, uh, 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 and a friend was with us from here and someone was talking to my friend from England and said, uh, have you been to London before? He said, yes, I came and preached here. And a number of years ago, my, the Londoner said, which church? And he said, I don't know the name of it, but it was an African-American church. And I said, no, it wasn't. He said, yeah, is it? No, we don't have African-Americans in England. <laughs> 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 and only then did I realize even the inherent racism mm -hmm. In, in the term, I mean, unless you want to call me a Euro-American, but, but I, it's just so far from the way we process and think and so deeply embedded that it does make listening critical. Because what listening does is it, 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 it exposes your potential blind spots. Um, it, it means I'm hearing something from you that's not the way I process reality. And if I'm really listening, sometimes I will recognize that person has raised something that is not in my sphere of attention that ought to be. Yeah, I, and you, you kind of bring up some things, I think, in the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, which is a terrible read in many ways, uh, but an important read. But these conversations sometimes take a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one conversation, mm -hmm. it's decades, mm -hmm. maybe. And the other thing, even with this Daughters of the Confederacy, and I'll hear this because the largest minority in this country are Latinos, there's over 60 million Latinos, and growing, is the sense of loss of what America used to be. Mm -hmm. What America used to be. And of course, that's always been changing, but there's this kind of idea that it's just frozen in time. The country has been changing since the founding of the Republic all the time with influx of, of new immigrants. And so the, the sense of loss on one side, it, it, you know, the Latino sensing loss on one side, but then on the Anglo side, there's a sense of loss because you're changing my country kind of idea. So. The, the negotiation of loss adds the, an emotional quotient you know, to the whole thing as well. I think also, just real quickly, I think to listen well, you also need to be willing to have the curiosity enough to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times if you don't ask any questions, you're not gonna even get to the, the listening that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, that's really important. But then also, you might ask a question, but if you don't have enough trust in the relationship. You might not you, you might think that you got the answer. But but the only answer you got was, I'll tell you what kind of answer you're getting, the kind of answer I give to people like you. <laughs> because I'm not gonna tell you what I really think. Because if I told you what I really think, you would say, I don't understand why you're so angry. I don't understand why you're being so political. I don't fill in the blank. Because people are often unwilling to, or to say I'm gonna answer the question the way that I really feel about it because their experience has been that when they tell people what they really thought, people then weren't ready to listen. They purportedly said they wanted to listen, but they'd already decided what listening meant. So I, I'm, I'm going to uh, give an opinion on something because I agree 100% with what you just said. Here's my opinion, all four of you are wonderful Christian men who've been transformed by the love of Christ. And so when you speak, you speak from that framework and that mindset. 
And one of the things that the Spirit seeks to change and transform in a believer is take a spirit of pride and reduce it down to a spirit of humility. And the listening you're talking about seems to me to be functionally profitable if it is the handmaiden of humility. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the listening in pride and arrogance is just falling into the trap that you spoke of when you laid the table mm -hmm. of saying, I'm listening, formulating my response now mm -hmm. because I know that I'm right mm -hmm. and this person is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one day after class, I teach a class at church, as you guys know, many of you know, many of you go there, and I hope I'm not singling out someone who's in here today but someone came up to me and said, let us lament the fact that we no longer have prayer in public schools. And can you not do anything about that as a lawyer? Can't you restore prayer in public schools? And I looked at this nice fella, I think actually it was a lady, and I said, um, Oh, heavens, no, I don't want to do that. She said, but you're a Christian. Don't you want prayer in school? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. I don't want mandatory prayer in school. She said, why not? I said, because some school districts are presided over by Mormons. Go out to Utah. Do you really want prayers to the angel Moroni being mandated for all of those children? I'm in a Baptist church. Do you want to go up in the Northeast and have Catholic prayers mandated for all those children? Do you want to get into an Islamic neighborhood and have Muslim prayers mandated? Well, no, they should be Christian prayers. <laughs> That's the privilege I was talking about earlier. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. But we've got to be willing to listen with an, an air of humility. What about when you're talking to someone who has no humility? Is there ever a time just to say, I don't want to talk to you, this is a waste of time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> done it many a time. <laughs> I've done it many a time. There comes a point where if the, if, if, you're, if the person you're engaging is not really interested in a conversation, you're, you're fooling yourself to think that you're having a conversation. Yeah, if I give an example, if I can... Yeah. I was talking to someone about immigration, and this person was making some comments, and I was just coming back with the data. Mm. And then the response was, I don't care about the facts. I know what I believe. <laughs> well, that was the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, just. I, I, was, uh, uh, I was on um, one of the uh, co-hosts or the panel on an hour and a half Fox Business News show where I'm walking, and I'd been on the show a bunch. I'm walking down the hall with the producer getting ready to go into the studio and he puts his arm on my shoulder and he says, remember we're Fox so don't call Biden President Biden just call him Biden we don't want to confer any honor on him wow. mm. and I smiled and I said, well actually he'll still be President Biden to me Mm -hmm. because that speaks to me of who I am mm -hmm. that doesn't speak of who he is. And he's the president of my country, and so I will give him the dignity of that title. And he says, well, okay, but, but your ratings would go up if you didn't. <laughs> I, I think that's interest. I would... That's interest. Mm -hmm. That's raw interest. Mm -hmm. That's toxic interests. The damage that is being done because we are not willing to listen to one another is immense. I think the only, so I'm, as the oldest person on this panel, <laughs> I'm gonna zag a, a, a little bit. I think Proverbs says answer a fool according to their folly and don't answer a fool according to their folly mm -hmm. back to back. 
I think I would be reticent to say that just because someone doesn't want to listen then or want to participate in the conversation I am excused from listening because it's the wise person who knows when to answer and when not to and when to leave and when not to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are some times when you want to leave a conversation and you can't and you have to stay there. Um, I think of like I, we can all think of examples of this, of someone who is screaming in pain or someone who is, um, you know, talking out, out of their senses or something. There are times when you just have to be there and, and stick it out. Um, and I think the same thing, we sometimes lash out in pain in other ways, and the wise person would want to discern, is that this or is it something else? The second uh, thing is, it's, it, sometimes we get in this frame of mind where we think that the thing that is will fix this conversation, get this person to agree with me, is to supply them with more information. And so I just need to rebut and rebut and rebut. Mm. There was a study these economists at uh, Harvard University carried out where they, took, they, they selected people from two polar extremes, gave them the same set of information, and they left, all the participants left more polarized from the same set of information. It, they just read it and it confirmed their own views more so, even though that's not, I mean, obviously it couldn't have said that. And so uh, I think we have to get out of that mind. That if I just supply the information that's lacking, Bill Agrew, that's not how conversations work. But also that sometimes you just, we just have to, I'm thinking of Galatians 6 too. It says, bear one another's burdens and those fulfill the law of Christ. And uh, the New Testament scholar Richard Hayes says, the bearing of, the law of Christ is Christ carrying his cross to Golgotha. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we're supposed to be emulating. And sometimes that's mm -hmm. having insults hurled upon you and not opening your mouth in return, mm -hmm. but still uh, sitting there and receiving them. Now, I'll piggyback on this because I was going to say this earlier and you've raised it again, so it's worth. We're told to bear a cross. Christians are supposed to know how to lose. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to lose, mm -hmm. oftentimes. And Jesus spent the whole second half of his ministry with his disciples saying, if you follow me, you're going to get pushed back from the world. Don't be surprised when it comes. Um, and you're going to have to bear a cross daily. You're going to, the passage, the passage in First Peter I'm going to talk about tomorrow night says three times, you're going to do the right thing and be treated poorly for it. So, um, so we do occupy that space. I don't, I don't walk, I, I thought, what I would say is I don't walk away from a conversation at the start, even if I recognize the person's pretty stubborn and dug in. I do the best I can to try and encourage the best out of people, oh. including myself. Vincent, before I move on, you got something to add. Yeah, so one, uh, would, I, would I say give up on certain conversations Yes, in the sense that, but I think there's, I don't know what some others have said. I think one of the questions is, is what, well, am I, do I have a, a long, ongoing relationship with this person? Mm -hmm. So what's the nature of the relationship mm -hmm. with this person? What kind of interaction is it? Uh, because if it's a relationship that I want to have, so, you know, people talk about perhaps in recent years, conversations at Thanksgiving have been difficult, let's say, because of political things. Um, do pe and people say, I, you know, generally, I feel like we can't talk to each other. Are people thinking about, in terms of not being able to agree, do I, do I want this relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, do, do, in other words, when, if, if parents and their kids are, are disagreeing with each other, okay, so how do you want this to cash out at the end of life in your deathbed? Do you, are you thinking about the relationship still being that way, even if you have these disagreements? And how are you going to navigate these disagreements if you're thinking about, well, I do value this relationship. So I think that that's part of it. So you might say, I'm gonna table this conversation because of what I want long-term with the relationship. So I think that there's that dimension of thinking about it. There's one thing I just wanna piggyback on that what Daryl said, it's kind of like piggyback on it, it's kind of like complicate what you said. Mm -hmm. So you said like, we don't know how to lose. Well, white people mm -hmm. that have privilege don't know how to lose. That's exactly people, right. A lot of people that are non-white are very good at knowing that when they think about bearing a cross, 
they've been quite good at it. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I think there are a lot of people who are unwilling to learn from those traditions. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder if for some Protestants, some evangelical Protestants, one of the reasons they're unwilling to learn from it is, if I talk about suffering, does that, am I somehow getting into one, either becoming a Catholic, or am I thinking about, does this mean earning my salvation in some way, if there's some kind of experience I'm having that's contributing to my development? Is there a kind of allergy that people have about what it really means to be an authentic believer in the true gospel that is not a gospel of works, then is there something that is like, I smell works there, and so I kind of don't want to go there, and which, which, is, which winds up being a formation problem in That's my That's right. Opinion. Yeah, and I've got something to add to that or, or take the conversation from there, but first, Danny, you had something else to add. Yeah, I'm going to kind of piggyback on my brothers here. Um, and there's it's kind of a question to you, and I know you've thought about this yeah. as we talk about these things. W when is it time to use a, the term, when is it time to be prophetic and to speak out? So there's this very famous talk that Frederick Douglass gave, and even the title is telling, What is the Fourth of July to a Slave? Mm -hmm. It's an amazing speech he gives. And what he's saying is, I'm living in this country, but this Fourth of July means nothing to us. Okay. Remember when he's writing, too. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. very important to yes. know when he's writing. So, and, and, and I think that's a very powerful thing, but when is it time to move from conversation to a prophetic word? When it's time to move from understanding to assessment. Okay, this is why I didn't drop assessment as a part of the conversation. What I'm trying to say is, is there comes a point in which you have your engagement you know what the lines of discussion are, what the interests are, what the shared interests are, et cetera. You know where everyone sits. This is actually also uh, piggybacks on when do you stop talking. And, 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 you then, and then it comes to the point of, all right, we've got to make an assessment about what it is that we're talking about. And in nothing that I'm saying am I saying do you back away from convictions <coughs> that you have. I am saying you examine the convictions that you have. And so at, at some point when you move to that point, and, and you say, this is, this is wrong, okay? That people treat this way, this one is wrong. The example that you gave about the Daughters of the Confederacy, there's something wrong about that, okay? That's the time, and you, and you get the right to be prophetic because biblically, God cares mm. deeply about justice. Not talking social justice, the way people define it. God cares about justice. He cares so much about justice. I've heard you preach on this. He cares so much about justice that he says, if you're engaged in worship and you don't care about justice, I don't care about your worship. And I like to remind people, we put worship pretty high up on our ladder. Uh, I was, I've got a book headed to print at Baylor. Um, one of the sections that I deal with in the book are the lawsuits that God files against Israel in Hosea and Amos. Mm -hmm. And those lawsuits, God sets out his charges. And his charges, more times than not, are you're, you're compromising justice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you're compromising the image of God is what you're doing. When you compromise justice, you defy the image of God that's yeah. present in others. Uh, and the poor, the downtrodden, the silent, those people. And you're worshiping another god. Mm -hmm. With, by definition. <laughs> yeah. By definition. He was just prophetic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I want to I want to kind of take what Vincent was saying and, and and put a slight shift on this, and that is talk about the morality of this dialogue, what's said and what's not. And, and to some extent, you brought this up as you s uh, listed two of five things that might damage conversation. Um, I, th there's a, a, in the area of communication theory, there's a whole section of study on the ethics of communication and persuasion. And uh, it, it draws from a 1937 article by, I think it was Miller, that said there are nine basic types of propaganda hmm. 
Propaganda is not ethical persuasion. It, by definition, is unethical persuasion. One of them is demonization, mm. uh, name calling. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are uh, other factors. But the morality behind what we're doing in the dialogue, I wonder if it matters. I reread recently P The Prince by Machiavelli. Mm. If you've not read it lately, go read it. Machiavelli was an Italian who was teaching uh, the youngest new ruler of the de' Medici family how to rule. And so he lays out the instructions. And in chapter 18, I think, could be 17, but 17 or 18, he says, look, when it comes to how you do things, don't worry about being virtuous. You can act with vice. People who act with virtue never get it done. So you have to act with vice. You have to do things. The, the end will justify the means. Then he adds, but pretend to everyone that you're religious. Because if you'll <laughs> pretend you're religious, they'll support you while you act with vice. So you'll have the support of the population and you can act any way you want to because they won't look at your actions. They'll believe you're one of them. A lot of people in politics today, some might say, follow Machiavelli's advice. My question to you is, do we have a Christian moral obligation in how we have this dialogue. You started us out, Daryl, quoting James 1. Mm -hmm. Is this a moral obligation? Mm -hmm. Discuss, please. Yeah, it's absolutely a moral obligation. Because what's at stake in the end is the perception of the God we confess. Um, my argument tomorrow night will be that our cultural war has done not just our society but the church damage because it has undercut the credibility of how we represent God. We are defending things, some are defending things, but we in a massive enough number are defending things that we should be lamenting. We are defending things that 15 years ago, we were vociferously arguing against. How can that be? And young people, when they see that, say, if that is your God and what your God does, I'm not interested. The damage is generational. I can, I'm, I can testify to that because a, a student that, that I've mentored he, he, t he says that his relationship with the church is at a standstill. It's not because of what he believes. It's because of what he, the, the dissonance around those things that he experienced in his church. I have a podcast and I did, I wound up doing three episodes in a row about scandal. <laughs> uh, I thought it would be just one. Well, it's three. Um, but he, when he emailed me, he was talking about that there were these experiences in his church that created the dissonance for him. So it's not, I don't think that he, he wants to stay out of church, but I think he, he doesn't know, I think for him, how to get his way back in. I, th I think the trust has been broken in a way for him and for many others that that's the case. So one other thing I would say about, about the moral imperative, when Paul is summing up the second greatest commandment in Romans 13, he says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Now, that sounds like a moral imperative to me. And if the second greatest commandment is what Christians ought to be characterized as, and that's all that we're doing horizontally, then it's a strange thing that we would, that we would even have to ask whether it's a moral imperative, honestly. Because are, are, are our actions seeking to do good to our neighbors, to, to lead to their flourishing, or are we thinking about something that compromises that, where we do wind up saying, well, in this case, I can do harm to my neighbor because of what my other interests are, rather than saying, no, love does no harm to a neighbor. 
and all my neighbors are human beings, and I can't put an asterisk beside any other human beings. And we're creating a schizophrenic um, community, belief community, I mean genuine belief community. There's a book that's come out that I would commend to everyone. It's about, it's called The De-church, the Dechurching of the Church, or some of the title, something close to that. It studies people who've left the church. There are three groups of people who've left the church who would be glad to come back if the church were what they thought it ought to be. And it's this dissonance that's causing them to be outside and remain outside because they don't want to be associated with what it is they perceive the church now to be. And they're probably, if you probe them for what they believe and the way they're seeing the reality of what's going on around them, you probably would say to yourself, they actually have a pretty biblical view of the way we should be living. But they can't stand the idea of going to a church that is inconsistent between what it reads in the Bible and what it sometimes preaches and what it does. Yeah, I would... Go ahead. I'm older than you. (laughs) <laughs> Don't forget to no, I mean, we're, we're deferring to our, our, our oldest member, at least. Yeah. Daniel, what he means is he doesn't have as much time left. <laughs> I told you we were old. I know. <laughs> but the truth was spoken in love. Yeah. Uh, this is where, I guess because of my work in the prophets, what is at stake ultimately is the person of God. Mm-hmm. And like Daryl said, you know, it's people, at the end of the day, they walk away from the church because they don't want the God of that church. Mm -hmm. And the God of the church, oftentimes that is preached and worshipped, is not the God of our faith. Mm -hmm. And our our God and our gospel has been co-opted by political ideologies. It's been co-opted by wealth uh, and rampant capitalism, if we... Our, our older son was in a city I will, I will, not, I will not mention. But he, he went to a church with his children, and it was movie day. So they had you know cutouts of movie characters and red carpets and popcorn for everybody. You walk into the church, and it's the soundtrack from Star Wars, and they show The Lion King. I mean, wh- wh- what have we come to? <laughs> and so worship... It's ultimately, who is the God of the church? Who is, who is the God of the songs and of the sermons? And uh, are we, you know, that becomes the battleground, and we've lost the battle. Mm-hmm. And our, you know, we work in a college, mm-hmm. and some of our young people are walking away from churches because of the God of the churches that they go to. And they, and they just don't want that God anymore. And so what's the solution? Walk out of the church. And so... What we need is another reformation. And I think this country is in the throes of a reformation that we're not aware of. Mm-hmm. Refora- reformations are messy times. And whether it's talking about race or, or women or things like this, um, the church is beginning to repent and beginning to point things out, but it's a messy time and we're not through it yet. But it'll be interesting to see what it looks like on the other end mm-hmm. and who will be the faithful remnant that remains. Because that's what will happen. So again, I'm speaking like a Old Testament. Daniel. Prophet. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I. You're. You had asked about. Are this is like a moral imperative for us? I think moral reasoning. This is not original to me. Always has to take into account who you are, the world in which you live, and the time in which you live, and the time in which you are living in it. So Oscar Romero has a different set of options and obligations. Mm-hmm and has to take a different disposition. My problem is I tend to view myself as the Oscar Romero when I'm more likely one of the parishioners that he's serving. Um, And so that's the basis from which we construct our kind of virtue of conversation, is who am I, where where am I living, and when am I living? Um, I think the second half of that is then how do the virtues govern us? Well, if you're a person of hope, I'm going to just pick the three traditional ones, faith, hope, and love. You're a person of hope. You believe that it's God's responsibility to make the world turn out all right, and he will do it. And if that's the case, then it is not my job to, in whatever ways I think the world has to be right, to to bulldoze over someone. And, And there are necessary caveats on all of that. 
Um, if it's, if I'm a person of faith, I believe that God is at work and present and with me and for me and present with the people around me and active in ways that I can't see. And if I'm a person of love, then I say this is the way, this is the, the, the bond of love is what governs and determines all of my interactions. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, seek the good of the other. And the other there isn't the neighbor who lives across the street from you. In that context, he's saying the person who's different from you, the person who eats different food, the person from a different background. Um, that person, and then he goes on to say, and I do this so that I might save some. But you were to seek, we're, love takes the shape of seeking the good of the immigrant, of the person who's incarcerated, of the person who's on welfare, of the person living in a mansion across the highway, whatever the case may be. You're, what does it look like to seek their good, knowing ultimately that God will make everything turn out all right? So, I'm thinking through the ramifications of this, and I'm role-playing in my head as you all speak. I'm role-playing with my friends, my email pen pals, who are going to send me emails that say, God loves what I believe, mm -hmm. and if we're going to help the people, we'll help them by not giving them stuff, but teaching them stuff, which means they have to teach it to themselves generally, or we write them off as not willing to learn. I'm hearing in my head the emails I'm going to get about American nationalism and God bless America uh, as opposed to God bless all the nations and why we must secure our borders to keep us safe from all of the people that want to come in and destroy the American way of life because Jesus was an American. <laughs> now, I am a very patriotic person, but I'm patriotic in the sense that Israel as a nation was placed into a land that had real weird geography. To the north was a superpower, Assyria. And I mean a superpower. To the south was a superpower, Egypt. To the west, was the Mediterranean Sea. To the east, the Arabian Desert. So any trade, any military power, as those superpowers clashed, went through a bridge, a land bridge called Israel. And God said, you're in a very precarious situation. I will bless you as a nation if you will uphold me as your God. So you will be blessed to be a blessing so that when people come through, you tell them, hey, we're dedicated to Yahweh. And you shine who I am and I'll bless you. But you quit shining who I am and you become like them. And you serve me no purpose as my witness and you'll just be ping-ponged back and forth between the Assyrians and the Egyptians for who's going to control you. And that's what happened. And I see America and nationalism okay, not even okay, something to be lauded, if we see that we're a country who's been blessed to be a blessing so that we can help the immigrants, so that we can help where there's chaos, so that we can stand up in a just war and defend uh, God and freedom and, and human rights. It's my last area. We only have about 10 minutes, but I'd like you to comment in the framework of nationalism. One of the things that people don't realize, and since you went to Old Testament stuff, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, nationalism is as old as time. Mm -hmm. You go to the Assyrians to the Egyptians, to the Babylonians, they all had their national gods that were 
the gods of the invasions and the empires. Babylon would actually talk about the founding of its city in, in relationship to the creation of the world itself. If you go now to India, you have the rise of Hindu nationalism. If you look at certain strands of Islam, Islamic nationalism, it is inherent to religion to be used for political ends. Okay? It's not just a Christian trap, mm -hmm. it's a religious trap. It's a human it, trap. It's a human trap, which is as old as time, mm -hmm. and we've fallen for it. And so I think we need to be aware of that, that we are falling into the common manipulation of religion for political ends. The other thing that I would say is I appreciate the analogy with Genesis 12 about being a, being a blessing because we're being blessed, but that's referring to the people of God ultimately. And we have a different citizenship. And so when people ask me, because I do a lot of speaking on the Bible and immigration, what should we do? And my question is, who is the we you're talking about? Are you talking about the church or the U.S. government? Those are two different conversations. But a lot of us can't separate those conversations, and we have to. Because what God would demand of his people is going to be a bit different than U.S. border policies. And so I think those two things, our identity as mm -hmm. a people mm -hmm. who have a different citizenship ultimately, in the fact that what we are seeing in this country with Christian nationalism, you saw it with Spain, when they, because of my Latino background, and they conquered the Americas, the British Empire, the French Empire, the Italian Empire, the German Empire, you see, the Dutch Empire, all of them using religion for the sake of conquest. This is what we've, what we've witnessed, um, and we're just, same song, 100th verse, uh, and because we're so narrow-minded about U.S., we don't understand that we're actually participating in a human reality mm -hmm. that we need to repent of. And if I can just elaborate. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a executive privilege, if you don't mind. I want you to get the last word. Okay, fair so enough. So let Vincent and Daniel add anything they want to add, and then you elaborate okay. and draw a line under everything, and we'll be done. Okay. Um, I think with the nationalism conversation, it's very important to emphasize, one, that I'm happy to talk about American exceptionalism, but when, however we talk about God in America, the first thing we need to understand is the Bible says nothing about Western Hemisphere countries. <laughs> and because it doesn't, and nobody should be asked, talking about us like we're a, a chosen nation. And so if you want to talk about in terms of God's providence, that God has made possible a context where Catholics and Protestants don't kill each other, and so that's make, that, that makes us accept. That's fine. But then, if Christians are in this country, I mean, again, wh what is determining what you do as a Christian and what your loyalties are? Is your loyalty to this particular, to these United States, to this American experiment that, about which God says nothing? Or is your loyalty to you know, God's kingdom that is broken in and is coming? And is that what your loyalty is? Because when we're, no, no, in none of the eschatology that we read about, does it talk about the United States of America? I'm not saying the United States of America is going away, it's a moral time, it's actually, my point is that we don't worship this country. And so this country should not be made an idol. And I think, so, so we, we, are we reminding ourselves of, of our identity, of our loyalties, and uh, arguably of what God's ultimately planning to do in the world not just in this land itself. And by the way, if people want to talk about what our nation is like, I mean, we've been really good at making certain things possible and we've done a lot of terrible things. Ask Native Americans about that, and speaking of invisible people. <laughs> right, we've done a lot of things, arguably in the name of, supposedly having some idea that God told us that, that we're some kind of new Israelites. So please go destroy people. New Testament people go destroy people. What, what New Testament imperative is there for conquest? Right? I don't really see one. So th there are other things I can say, but I, but I think it's important to emphasize those things. Now, the people that might email you, my question is, are they people that you can have conversations with where you can ask them, hey, tell me what's the thing that really makes you nervous? And if the thing that's really making you nervous is you're just afraid of the unknown because you're used to an America in which you are comfortable. Mm -hmm. 
but you're not thinking about other people being comfortable. You don't want to say it that way necessarily. But now I guess I've said it for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just refer him to the video. Yeah. <laughs> my, yeah, my, I was actually, Vince uh, stole my, or I'm, stole, I'm preempted so, me. I'm sorry. My, my grandmother's family comes from Bermuda. They're not native Bermudians. They were the Pequot genocide in the 1600s. All the survivors get shipped to Bermuda where they live for generations. And so I, my thought is like to love America, that's a, a complicated story for some people. Um, I don't think you could talk to my grandmother about love for the country like you, someone whose family has been living in, you know, Kentucky for 30 years. I think it'd be a hard, that would be a hard conversation for her because of all that historical baggage. Um, and the, the only, so my thought on nationalism is this is not helpful. I'm telling you that up front. I like pizza. If I like pizza, I love pizza. It's my favorite thing. I love it so much. It's not my favorite thing. That's exactly, <laughs> the Lord and my wife and my son are great too. <laughs> if I love pizza. Pizza's number four, got it. Yeah, 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 for sure. If I love pizza to the same degree that I love my wife, you would all think that I have some disorder. And it would be a disordered love. I think we have a tendency to, to love things to a proportion that they ought not be loved. And if you are going to do that, you gotta sign up for the whole package. You can't be like, I, I love my state, my nation, as much as I love the Lord, and then say, but I don't want any part of what happened in Indonesia in the 70s and 60s. No, you gotta take the whole, you gotta take it all. Um, and that's, that doesn't mean you need to just be completely pessimistic about something. Uh, I think it would be a kind of indifference um, to say the Lord is doing good things because the Lord is always at work in surprising ways. Um, and it makes me think of Augustine at the end of his life when the Roman Empire is crumbling. And he's not having some crisis of identity about, well, am I still Roman? They're right outside my door. Like they're, That's not the last letters he's writing. That's not how he finishes his notes on John. Because he thinks, well, empires come and go, but that my citizenship is in a kingdom that outlasts them all. All right, Daryl, bring us to a close, please, sir. Okay, um, let me start with Israel's example, because Israel's example explains why no Western country is in the Bible in the way that we were talking about. Israel had all the advantage to be the people of God. They had God's presence, they had God's law, they had God interacting with them, they had the worship of God, but they lacked one thing, a changed heart. So we got a new covenant, and the history of Israel was fits and starts, just like every nation. So then that raises the question, where does God do it? God does it in the kingdom that he has formed of kingdom people. So what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? What makes being a citizen of heaven distinctive? It means I care about the other. It means I care about the enemy. It means I love the enemy. Jesus said in his most ethical speech, he called us to love the enemy. Why? Because if you just love the people who love you, what's the big deal in that? So here's what I'm saying, I think that my reconciliation with God aims at the reconciliation of the other of whom I am one, along with other others. And God takes those others and he puts his spirit in them because that's what they need and he makes us one. God has adopted us as his children. The question is, have we adopted one another? And the one another who is looking for adoption comes from every tribe and every nation. And that's why I listen. Would you join me in thanking these gentlemen? This is the dialogue of the weekend.
And so if you would like to hear an incredible lecture, if you have not yet registered, uh, we'll make room for you. And so please register. Let us know you're planning on coming tomorrow night. Daryl Bach here, 7 o'clock. Um, it's going to be good, right? Just six biblical verses. Bring your Bibles. Um, I know that uh, we ran a little bit long, but it was worth it. Uh, again, my deep gratitude to each of you on this panel for what you've said. My gratitude to all of you for listening or watching. And uh, uh, I pray God speed on you. Uh, these gentlemen, I'm sure, are glad to shake your hand and visit with you. Um, if you do want to engage them in dialogue and you notice there are people behind you, please don't launch into a 20-minute dialogue because the people <laughs> behind you, it's not fair to them. And these three of these guys are old enough to need to use the restroom. So, <laughs> so Daniel will answer worried. for the rest of it. <laughs> I'm just listening. Anyway, uh, uh, God bless you all. Thank you for being here.